Well, good morning, church. Come on, let's worship together this morning.
person watching from home. I thank you for each life, God, each breath of life that you've breathed into all of us, each purpose we all have, God, to glorify you, to build your church, to reach this nation, to bring glory to you, God. And I pray as we go into this morning, as the word comes forward, God, that you be in it, you be moving, that you're omnipresent, that no matter where we are, you are there. In every house, as the word is spoken, your Holy Spirit will flow through all of our hearts. And we're expectant for what you're going to say this morning, God. We thank you so much for the opportunity to have church. We're so fortunate to be able to have church while there's so many countries and people who can't, who are staying hiding, God, that we can stand firm and know that we love you. We can proclaim that for all the nation to hear, God. It's a privilege to be a part of your kingdom, God. We love you, and we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name. This week we continue with our series, I Believe. We learned about Jose and how he was only eight years old when he became king. He showed us that we can never be too big or too small to believe in the Lord. He turned to God with all his heart and his strength, obeying his word and sharing it with others. God gave us the Bible so we can know what is right and what is wrong. But sometimes it could be hard to understand or confusing. But when that happens, we can ask the people we trust in God for help. And if we still don't understand, we can just believe in God and believe in what He says in the Bible. For this weekly challenge, I ask you to draw a picture or write a note about something you learned about this week's lesson or about the Bible. And share it with your friends and your family, just like Josea did. Let's see your submissions. When we read the Bible, it helps us to get all the idols out of our life. Just like Josiah, when we read the Book of Laws, it helps us make better choices. God is the Bible is for me. We learned the Bible is for who? For me. Oh, that's wonderful. I can tell my friends that God is the creator of everything and he made us in his own image. Hello everyone. We are so glad to announce that we are now back meeting in person. Please make sure you register online for the service of your choice. If this is your first time joining us, we are glad you found us. We would love to connect with you, so please click on the I'm new here button below and we will contact you with a free gift. Thank you for your faithful giving. Your giving helps meet ministry needs of the church and beyond. For details on how you can give, go to our church website or just click on the link below. If you have never been water baptized, we would love you to consider being baptized here on Sunday, July 18th. Please call the church office or go to kwcf.life to sign up. And now, let's hear this morning's message from Pastor Ken Miles. Well, good morning, everyone. This is our first Sunday back together in person. And I will be preaching this message to an auditorium with people in it. Right now, I am not because I'm recording this for those of you that are watching at home. And I trust that you are well 
And I look forward to seeing everyone that's watching this at home today. I hope that you will make the effort and come out, be with us in person in one of our three services uh, that we will have at 8, 9.30, and 11.30 going forward until things open up a little further. Well, today's message, we are continuing on our theme that God is doing a new thing. And I want to talk to you this morning about something that's not necessarily new, but it's maybe new to us. I want to talk about a new voice that God wants us to realize and use a new voice. Now, this whole thought came to me uh, just last week. Kay and I were doing a devotional together, and it was from Psalm 27 and verse 8. And it said this, <clears throat> David is speaking. He said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. And as we were reading it, that just jumped off the page to me for some reason. Because David is saying, the Lord said to him, seek my face. And David doesn't respond, and I reply back. Or I said, or out of my mouth I said. He, he says it differently. He said, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. And it made me realize that maybe we have more than one voice. When I think about my voice, I think about my natural voice, I think about my vocal cords, and everything that I say is coming out of this voice that I'm speaking to you today with. But David had a different voice. His heart had a voice. And it was his heart that said to the Lord, Your face, Lord, I will seek. So, we need to realize you have more than one voice. You have a natural voice, but also your heart has a voice. And this is the first point I would say to you. Your heart has a voice, and God hears it. Now, many times you don't hear the voice of your heart. Sometimes, like the Bible says, we, 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 our heart is something that we don't understand. And we don't know what is in our heart many times. And, but your heart is speaking. And here's what David said in another place in Psalm 84 too. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So he's saying in this verse, not only is my voice of my flesh crying out, but the voice of my heart is crying out to the living God. So your heart is speaking all the time. And it is speaking and God hears that voice. I wonder what your heart is seeking. Uh, I, I've shared before that my dad, an expression that he used many times when I was a young person growing up, and we'd have different young people come out, work with us on the farm, and every now and then dad would say, you know, I like that young man. He has a heart after God. I didn't know exactly what my father meant at that time, but is it possible that he sensed the heart of the young person that was working on the farm, that he sensed that his that person's heart was crying out for the Lord, was seeking the Lord. It's David said here that his heart was seeking after the Lord. Perhaps is that why the Lord said about David that this is a man after my own heart? Is it possible that David's heart was after God even before David knew his heart was after God, but his heart was crying out to God and God heard it and said, this is a man after my own heart. Now, these are some things that started to percolate in my mind and my thinking. 
as I began to uh, meditate on this. And I want to share some of the things that came out of that with you this morning. And so here's the another take home I would say to, for you. The Lord hears the words of our heart more than the words of our mind. My natural voice is speaking words of my mind. But I want you to know that God hears the words of our heart and what it's saying. And many times that drowns out the words that I might be speaking verbally because my, the voice of my heart is speaking. Here's the next point. Man's focus is outward. God's focus is inward. It says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Not only does he look at the heart, but he also hears the heart. We just hear outward things. We can just observe on the outward. But God has perceptions that go way beyond our own. He's created our heart and he can hear what our inner person is saying. And so we need to be aware that God sees way beyond what we are saying, even what we're doing. God's more concerned about why you're doing something than what you're doing. We see what people do. We, we hear what people say. But God hears inwardly. He sees why they're doing it. And he sees those inward motives. So our inward words can drown out our outward words. Now here's the next point. God only hears prayers from a sincere heart. From a sincere heart. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 1 and verse 15. The Lord's looking at Israel in their times of gathering together and their worship experiences. And he says this. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. So, you might outwardly be saying a prayer. And God's hearing the outward prayer, but he's also hearing the inward prayer from the heart. And it says in this case that the Lord turned his eyes from their outward expression and did not want to hear it. Now, why is that the case? What well, goes on and tells us in the next verses. In Isaiah 29, 13, and also Jesus repeats the same verse from the Old Testament in Matthew 15, 8. Now, this is what it said. These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so Jesus is referencing Isaiah's reference here where God turns his, his eyes from those that are outwardly saying something because the heart's not connected to it. It's not joined with it. He, their mouth was saying something outwardly, but their heart was saying something different. So God's design for us is that our natural words are meant to be the outward expression of the words of our heart. What we're speaking out of our mouth needs to be an expression of what our heart is saying. And so when I speak to other people, I need to allow the words of my mouth to be an expression of what's in my heart. When I speak to God, he wants the words of my mouth to be an expression of that which is in my heart. Listen to how Job words it in 33 and verses 2 to 4. Now I will open my mouth. My tongue speaks in my mouth. My words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So Job, when he is speaking, and it says he's a perfect man, 
He's the perfect man, not that he d never did anything wrong, but in the sense that his heart was perfect and he was always honest and his outward words were an expression of his heart. And he said, my tongue's moving in my mouth, but the words are actually coming from an upright heart and that God had made him and had breathed into him uh, the spirit of life. And so we see how God has designed us and he wants us to be. He wants our outward words to be the same as the inward words that our hearts are speaking. Now, here's the next point I'd say to you. Idle words are words disconnected from the heart. Idle words. The Bible talks about idle words. Um, it says in Psalm 12, verses 1 to 2, The sons of men speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and listen, and a double heart they speak. So he's saying these people speak idle words. They're really not connected to uh, their heart, or they have a double heart. They are trying to express something outward that I'm one way, but the inward heart is saying something different. And so there's a sort of a double speak that's coming out here, as the, as the scripture says. And it says that this is what's happening. And then it says in Matthew 12 and 36, Jesus says, But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. So idle words, what are idle words? I would suggest to you, idle words are words that are spoken that are disconnected from our heart. We're just speaking them out. Uh, we're not really sincere. Uh, we're, just, we're just saying words. We're trying to impress someone. We're trying to flatter someone. Uh, there's a lack of sincerity. And Jesus said, you know, we're going to give an account for every idle word. Why? Because it's a matter of integrity. An integrity of heart. Is my outward mouth speaking what my inward heart is saying? Now, this, this is quite a topic here. Um, Jesus was our perfect example of how to speak. Jesus' outward words that he spoke out of his mouth always came from a pure heart that was connected to God. Listen to what it says in John 6, 63. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. The words Jesus was speaking, he said, they're not just natural uh, vibrations in the air. The words I'm speaking to you are spirit and they're life. They're coming from my inward being. They're coming from my heart that, of course, was God, the Father was in this man, Christ Jesus, and the physical words he was speaking were words of spirit and they were words of life. Now this is our example. This is what we're going after when we're talking about having a new voice. And I'm challenging you to have a new voice. A voice that when you speak out, you're speaking from your heart, you're sincere, you have integrity, and there's honesty in your words. You're not speaking any idle words. Your words are coming out of your heart. Now here's the next point. What about lying words? This is what I suggest to you. Lying words are words that do not express what's in your heart. Now idle words are disconnected from your heart. You just sort of talk and just, just spewing words out. But lying words is when you know something in your heart, but your outward words are saying something different. Um, Acts 5 and verse 3 is a real example of this. Ananias and Sapphira, they had a piece of property. They sold it. They gave it to the church and said that they were giving the total price that they got, they were giving to the church. But really, they, they weren't. They were lying. They really kept back a portion. They said they sold it for X amount of dollars. 
and they gave that to the church, but really they, they sold it for more than that, and they kept the difference. But they let on like they were giving it all. Now listen to what Peter says to them in Acts 5 and verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has, listen, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. And he goes on to say, you know, you didn't have to give it all. You could have just given a portion of it. But you lied. And Satan filled your heart. And you said outwardly you were giving everything, but you weren't giving everything. You were holding back. And he said, Satan has filled your heart. Now, this is, this is how Satan works. He works in our heart. He wants to corrupt our heart. So we don't say what's coming from our heart. We will say something different with the words of our mouth. That's not really what's in our heart. And so Ananias were saying outward words, but it was a lie. And he was actually lying to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's in his heart. And he was grieving that and doing false. And, was, and he was sinning. And he was not expressing, and he was actually lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, these are, these are interesting concepts, and, and it's a sort of a fresh look at this on how, what causes us to lie? It's, our lies are coming out of a heart that we're being deceitful. We're not wanting people to know what's in my heart. I'm not being honest. And so the outward words I'm speaking it's dishonest. And so we're not just lying to one another. Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit because as Christians, the Holy Spirit has been invited into our hearts. Now, here's, here's how I would summarize this. Ananias' outward words of generosity were a lie. He was being generous, but because he lied about that generosity and was deceitful in his heart, Ananias' outward words of generosity were a lie. Now, I, I want to just give you another example, sort of flipping it a little bit, and about Peter, and when Peter denied the Lord. Uh, Jesus had been arrested. He was being taken into trial, and Peter's out warming, him, warming himself by the fire, and it says in Matthew 26 and verse 71 to 72. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And so Peter is caught up in this whole thing. And you read the background of this. I mean, he was trying to defend the Lord in the garden. When they, he was being arrested, he drew his sword. He was swinging uh, to, to, uh, to fight for Jesus. And Jesus says, put up your sword, Peter. You know. And, and this, Peter is just disillusioned. He doesn't understand what's happening. They all scatter. They all run. But he follows Jesus afar off. He comes to the fire. He's trying to watch from a distance. But now he's being confronted by this girl. I, this man was with Jesus. And, and now three times he denies that he knew Jesus. But this is what I would say to you. And it, now think, follow me here. Peter's outward words of denial was a lie. It was different than what his heart was. His heart was after God. His heart cared for Jesus. He's in this situation now where he's caught. He's sort of backed into a corner. And rather than being honest from his heart to identify, yes, I know this man. But now he lies. His outward words are not an expression of his heart. Because here's the point. Just because Peter said he didn't know the Lord didn't mean that he didn't know him. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me comfort. God's listening to the words of your heart. Your outward words, Peter's outward words were, I don't know him. 
And yet inwardly his heart was longing after God and he knew Jesus and cared for Jesus. I'm glad the Lord's listening to my heart. Now he hears the outward words too and what we say outwardly is important. I'm not trying to diminish that. But I'm just saying God hears the voice of our heart. You have another voice. The voice in your heart. And what God wants is us to unite the voice of our heart with the voice of and the words that are coming out of my mouth. Then we walk in integrity. We walk in honesty. And we can be all that God wants us to be. Now with that in the background. I just want to look at five things here. That is an application. Of the voice of your heart. And I want to talk about. Five areas quickly here. First is salvation. Second is prayer. Third is worship. Fourth is fellowship. And the fifth is is service for the Lord. Now let's just look about our salvation experience. Here's the point. Salvation is received when asked for by the heart. It's not just a prayer with your lips. You could say an outward prayer receiving the Lord with your lips and it not be effective. Salvation is effective only when your outward prayer to receive the Lord is an expression of your inward heart that is also crying out to receive the Lord. Now listen to how Paul words this in Romans 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. See, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the, our whole salvation experience is not outward things we do. Well, I raised my hand. I went to the front of the altar. Um, I, I prayed a prayer or, or even getting baptized. All those outward things are to be an expression of our heart. And the outward prayer you pray to receive the Lord, if it is not joined with your heart, faith in your heart that's longing after God, it will not be enough. The words of your mouth must be an expression of the faith in your heart and the, and the cry of your heart, what your heart is saying, the voice of your heart. You are just verbalizing outward what the cry of your heart is. Now, this is very powerful and that's what brings salvation. Now, Jesus warns if it's not this way, he says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You see, if, if what you are saying outwardly is not connected to your heart, then the Lord says, really, I didn't hear that outward prayer. When you said, Lord, Lord, outwardly, but your heart is resistant inwardly, and there's a rebellious heart, but you're confessing with your mouth that you're calling Jesus Lord. Jesus said, I'm not going to hear that. Now, folks, this is just speaking to me, uh, and, and I hope that it's speaking to you this morning. The value of having a new voice. That the voice you're speaking is expressing the new voice in your heart that is crying out. Lord, let it be. So that's the air of salvation. What about the air of prayer? Here's the point. Prayers are answered when spoken from our heart. Prayers are answered when spoken from our heart. Listen to what Psalm 21 and verse 2 says. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. We're requesting something from our lips, but the Lord sees it as a heart's desire. And so he will not withhold that which is being expressed from our heart because our heart is joined with God's spirit, your heart's prayers will always be genuine. But 
your thinking, your thoughts, your emotions, they are not always pure. And we pray for a lot of things that's not God's will. That's why he says, if you ask anything according to my will, if you ask anything according to your heart that's joined with God's heart, and in he, your heart's crying something out, you pray that prayer, and I'll give you your heart's desires. Listen to what David says in Psalm 17. And uh, verses 1 and then verse 3. David says, Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. You have tested my heart. See, God always tests your prayers to see if it's connected to your heart that's joined with God's heart that is filled with his spirit. And when those things come together, your prayers are going to be answered. Now, Jesus gives the example, and we're familiar with this. Let me just quickly talk about the prayer of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Let me just read it to you in Luke 18, verses 10 to 13. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He prayed with himself. He did, it didn't really go beyond himself, but this is what he said. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. Here's the Pharisee, outwardly a better man. I mean, he really is fasting. He really is giving his tithe. He's doing all these other things. Uh, he's being outwardly right. But see, his heart was not right. The tax collector who was outwardly doing bad things, but his heart was crying out to God saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that man's prayer was heard. Even though it's coming from a, a sinful man, his heart was crying out to God, acknowledging his wrong. And that's what you have to see. When you come to God, you have to be honest. You can't hide your sin. You can't shield your sin by listing all the good things you are doing. You have to just come honest before the Lord and let the inward cry of your heart be expressed through your mouth. It causes us to humble ourselves before God and before others. We can confess our faults to one another because our heart's crying out to God for repentance and, and forgiveness. And so in that, purity of my mouth expressing what's in my heart, I can confess to others my, my sins. I'm not being prideful. I'm not trying to let on I'm something that I'm not. This is so vitally important that you have a new voice. A voice that outwardly speaks what your heart is speaking, even though the heart might be evil, but it's confessing its sins to the Lord. Then let your mouth confess that because God hears that prayer. He said the tax collector's prayer was heard. The Pharisee prayer was not. He just prayed among himself. Wow, that, this is powerful. There's one other aspect of this I just want to add here because I've always wondered about when, when the, the scripture tells us to pray without ceasing. And if I think prayer is my outward lips speaking, always talking to God, how do I answer that prayer? How do I uh, follow that admonition to pray without ceasing? Ah, but if I understand my heart has a voice and my heart is speaking to God all the time, I'm living in his presence. My heart is joined with God and my heart is constantly praying. My lips may not be speaking, but my heart is praying. So I can pray Outwardly, the heart can speak without physical words. Wow. That opens up all kinds of possibilities and all kinds of thoughts. But our prayers are an expression of our heart. Now here, here's the third area, worship. 
Worship is accepted when spoken by the heart. They have to be spoken from the heart worship. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody. Where? In your heart to the Lord. It's not singing and making melody with your emotions, with your outward vocal cords, uh, and just singing a happy tune, uh, uh, and just a natural song. That's not where worship comes from. Worship comes from the heart. True worship is expressed by your heart's voice. And as your heart is worshiping God, and you join your natural voice with your heart's voice, that's what brings it as a great crescendo before the Lord. Worship and praise that's acceptable in his presence. And he longs and he inhabits the praises of his people. Not just because they're speaking words. We saw in Isaiah, it says he'll turn his eyes from gatherings that the heart's not in it. But if our heart is in our worship and our praise, God receives it. And it's a beautiful thing in his presence. And he inhabits it. Here's the next application. Fellowship is fostered by words spoken from the heart. Words spoken from the heart. Listen to what uh, it says in Psalm 55, 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Here, David is talking about those around him who could butter him up. Their, their words were smooth like butter. Uh, but he realized, you know what? There was another ulterior motive. There was war in their heart. Their mouth was very soft, but there was war in their heart. Oh, wow. I'm wondering about fellowship that we have with one another. Could our outward words be so smooth, so well-chosen, and they're, they're just sort of so sweet, and yet there's war in our heart towards our brother and sister, and that we have drawn swords in our heart. We talked about this about the other week, about letting the Lord be our defense, that the sword's in the, the mouth of the Lord. Let him be our defense. Let our hearts be yielded. May our hearts be loving and caring for one another and forgiving to one another. And if we could do this, our fellowship will come together. You know, really, fellowship is not body to body. It's not mind to mind. I'm sharing my thoughts and the other person's hearing my thoughts. And so that's fellowship. You know, true fellowship starts in the heart. The, the body of Christ is united one member to another member with heart connections. My heart is joined with someone else's heart. And so to join the church is not just necessarily to take out membership and attend all the services and get involved in this and that. True membership in the body of Christ is when your heart is joined with other people in the heart or in their heart, other people in the body. And just as the natural body is joined, one member to another member to another member, all directed by the head, the Bible says this is what the church is. Christ is the head. We're joined one to another. Where is that joining? In our hearts. And so when we fellowship, it needs to be heart to heart. And, and we talk about, you know, having conversations, saying, you know, I really sat down and had a heart to heart with that person. What we meant was, you know what, I, I was just really sincere and I was very honest and we really connected in our heart. We had a heart to heart. Folks, that's how all fellowship needs to be. Heart to heart. No deception. No ruse. But we're just being open. And, and, and when you speak to someone, speak from your heart. You know, we talk about someone who gets up to speak, say, you know, I didn't prepare anything. I just want to talk to you from my heart. That's good. Now, it doesn't mean we can't prepare, but it does mean what you're saying is from your heart. You're not just making words. One speaks peacefully with his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. Again, this is the problem. And then Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. With their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Lord, help us to have pure heart-to-heart -heart connections 
in fellowship. Now, here's the last application of this. We're commissioned for service. Our commission for service is accepted by the heart. When the Lord calls us to do something, we accept it not by my verbal words, but we receive it and accept it in our hearts. Listen, Jesus gave this parable about a man who had two sons, Matthew 21, verses 28 to 31. But what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. And Jesus asked the question, which of the two did the will of his father? Now, here's how I would summarize it to you in light of what we're saying this morning. The first son, his mouth said no, but his heart said yes. And so even though his mouth said no, he later went and did what his heart was leading him to do. The second son, his mouth said yes, but his heart said no. And Jesus is giving this parable to tell these people, listen, it's not what you say with your mouth, it's what your heart says. And it's what you do. And folks, most of the time we're acting out of our heart, not out of just a desire to do what I think I should or what I want other people to hear. Wow. So these, these five areas to receive salvation, to have effective prayers, to have worship that's acceptable in God's presence, to have true fellowship, and to serve God and work in his vineyard. All of these things have to come out of the heart. So here's my final point to you this morning. How are we going to perfect this voice, the voice of our heart? How do we influence what my heart is saying? Because sometimes I don't even know what it's saying. But how do I influence my heart so it's saying the right thing? And here's the point. Tend your heart to perfect its voice. Tend your heart to perfect its voice. This is what Proverbs 4.23 says. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You have to keep your heart. You have to realize your heart has to be kept, tended, cultivated. Because God connects to us in our heart. You know, he gave a parable in Mark 4, and I won't read all the verses. You're, most of us are familiar with the parable that Jesus gave. The sower went out to sow, and he sowed the word. And the words that was sown was sown into four soils. There was wayside soil, stony soil, thorny soil, and then good soil. And he said they're their hearts. And, and God connects with our heart. And the condition of our heart will determine what the result is, what benefit, what fruit comes from that relationship. And so we are to keep our heart with all diligence. We are to cultivate our heart. Listen to what it says in Luke 6.45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And so we need to cultivate our heart. We need to say, Lord, what are the things in my heart that's keeping me from receiving what you're saying to me in my heart? And so here's the first thing. You just need to give your heart to the Lord. Proverbs 23, 26 says, my son, give me your heart. Just give your heart to God just sincerely from your heart. Say, Lord, I need you. I need you. You can start wherever you're at. You can start by saying, Lord, I'm not sure I want to give you my heart. But Lord, I want to give you my heart. Start sincerely wherever you are from your heart. That many prayers are, Lord, I don't know whether you're there or not. But if you're there, show yourself to me. That's a prayer from your heart that God responds to and hears. Give the Lord your heart. And just determine 
that I'm going to speak out of my heart. Listen to what Jesus said to Nathanael, who was coming to him to be his disciples. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael was just honest. He would blurt out things that others wouldn't say. But the Lord looked at him and said, you know what? There's a man whose heart is honest. And if you come to the Lord in honesty and express your heart to, to God, no matter what state your heart is in, just allow your outward words to be united to your heart. You're going to see seeds sown in your heart, words that the Lord gives you. They'll bear fruit, much fruit. So cultivate your life. Cultivate your heart. Remove all those things that distract. And just set your heart after the Lord. And He will meet you. I, my prayer this morning is that God will give us a new voice. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, we have read your word today and it does challenge us because we see many times Lord how we speak outward words either to you or to other people and we're not truly being honest from our heart and so Lord I ask that you would give us a new voice today everyone that's heard this word today we'd have a new voice our outward words connected to the voice of our heart that we would express to you a hunger and a desire, and that we'd have integrity and honesty and sincerity in your presence. And as a result, Lord, you would use us in all these ways, Lord. We'd be saved. Our prayers will be effective. We'll worship you, and we'll have fellowship with others, and we can do your work. Oh, Lord, may this be so. I pray it for myself and for everyone that hears my words this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.